Welcome to the Together Pop-Up Poetry Cafe for LGBT Plus History Month 2024 with Rihanna Valentine, D.L. Williams, Marcella Rick, Ron McIntyre and Cedar Whelan. Supported using public funding by Arts Council England. Good evening or good morning depending on where you are in the world and welcome to the Together Pop-Up Poetry Cafe. If you would like to access the captions, which are provided by a real human being rather than AI, then use the captions bot button, which is usually found at the bottom of your screen, or follow the link in the chat if you prefer to read the transcript. I'm Ju Gosling, Artistic Director of Together 2012 CIC. I'm a white woman with pale olive skin and green eyes behind black plastic glasses. I'm wearing a purple trilby hat over my hennard crop, a purple hoodie over a mauve jumper and silver coloured jewellery. We're celebrating LGBT plus History Month 2024 in the UK and this year's theme is medicine. As deaf and disabled LGBTQI people, we have a very problematic relationship with the medical system including mental health and learning difficulty services. Tonight's poems reflect that with some strong language and distressing topics. If you're feeling vulnerable or you realise when hearing a poem that you're finding it upsetting, please do switch off your sound temporarily or consider watching the event recording later instead when you can also fast forward. The recording will be available from next Monday on our events page and the details of our website are in the chat. Our first poet tonight is Rihanna Valentine. You may remember Rihanna from the film One Inky Queer, which won the CAT First Film Award at the Together 2022 Disability Film Festival. Rihanna describes themselves as a trauma poet keeping it light. Rihanna co-authored Fragmented Light, their Saboteur Award nominated joint collection with their grandmother, Carolyn Reed. Their upcoming pamphlet, Mad Again, will be published with Written Off, with Written Off in May 2024. Rihanna featured in Muswell Press's Queer Life, Queer Love 2 and Ergy Press's Lockie Anthology. They were shortlisted for the Zealous Amplify Prize and longlisted for the Disabled Poets Prize. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Rihanna. Hello. It's lovely to be here this evening uh, and it's a real honor to open up this event. Uh, disabled events and spaces are my favorite places to perform um, because you don't have to apologize for the fact that, for example, all three of my poems are quite angry <laughs> when talking about medicine. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, the first one I was gonna perform tonight uh, for you guys is uh, the second poem I ever performed on stage. It's a couple of years old and I haven't performed it for a couple of years. Um, and it's been stuck in my head um, for months and I've been nagging to be re-performed. So ev evidently it knew you was gonna ask me to come along tonight. Um, it's hopefully the right thing to kick off with. Um, and it's after, uh, there's a wonderful book about fibromyalgia, uh, which is one of the things I have uh, called Tender Points by Amy Berkowitz. And it's very much after I read that because it was the first time I'd read any writing by anyone else with fibromyalgia. So yeah, reading Tender Points. I rarely usually get angry, but lately my anger is coming back to me, uninvited, unwieldy, my arms wrench, buckling, knees under its screaming blood mass. I'm drawn fast back past each doctor's blank face, their short answers, shrugged shoulders, a shock at first now so familiar. Another femme for the bucket that once was called hysteria. I must fasten my fury to function and try in vain to get what I need from them, ignore the rub that the one exception met is inaccessible, but somehow yet not give up. 
lest I be accused of wallowing in my sickness, lazy, happy on benefits, I've heard the pain is an invention anyway. I have grown used to my rage, so used to suppressing it, my subconscious is slick. I barely even notice it, but someone else's analogous experience makes my insides curdle raw. Come now, hindsight protector, step each man doctor face into every linoed floor, pull the stethoscopes tight until breathing is no more. Go ahead, take the funding. It never arrived anyway. And leave the rest of us in peace so needed. Fibro mysteries to tend gently. Still pained, but less sore. Oh, well, that was lovely to read that again. <laughs> that needed out again. These things are spirals, you know. Um, uh, so thank you so much for listening to that first one. I've got a couple more. Uh, they get progressively, hopefully, more exploratory and less angry. Uh, not necessarily that we all get less angry over time, but probably just a bit more tired. Um, <laughs> um, this next one uh, is after Denez Smith. Denez Smith has a wonderful poem uh, called Litany with Blood All Over uh, about their HIV experience. And I wrote after it about uh, my fibro and migraines and other things. Um, Cause they just like, I felt like they wrote about illness in a whole new way. Um, and this is in my upcoming pamphlet, which will be coming out in May with Written Off Publishing, which is called Mad Again. Uh, I know that there's other performers here who are going to talk about mad poetry as well. Um, yeah, so. Litany with pain all over. I can't tell you anything. I have pain throughout which eludes explanation. I imagine myself a house with dry rocks, a river hot, acid polluted, some glorious oak table, termites in the legs, eating, a virus porn web, riven. I serve you up four gauzy metaphors on palette platters to paint the sense of interior apparitions. Yes, this derelict ballroom is haunted, tangled danced with an absence that lost its appeal. Pain interrupts, a petulant child shouts, no! I remain daffodil gazing, mutter, why are you like this? A stream that hates its verges, I want to be the ocean or anything else. That which lives in me unclearly, sometimes I wish it was simple as the blood, tests say nothing. But then again, better not. Lifelong doctors understand nothing. Test results again say nothing. Could be wrong. The tests always say nothing. My body howls everything at once. Leave me in the bucket. Medically, I am a woman. Under-researched, underfunded, unboxed only after ticks have been ticked. So, damn acceptance, I am never settled, too determined, a boxing match where I fight myself, my willpower, that was what got me here. How often is the cause the solution? Thorn, sin, tear, burden, ache, mystery, cry, fuck, run dry. Again, I have too many words for hurt and not enough. Some imitation, Inuit, no lacking, no lingual intuition. Tradition does not survive here. It lives somewhere between lymph and distress, between joints and the tenderest fibers, between dented spirit and synovial fluid, between memory and what might have been. Can't estrange a legacy 
oh, so many ways to inherit trauma. So many gifts from my mother. I once let them brick me in, run me on into walls, destruction, walls hurt. Here's Johnny, back so soon, old pain. I am all the characters in every horror movie I've seen, panicked, retreating, dead in the next five minutes, or torture tabled, full of needles, full of poison medicine. I can't move. Who knows? I might have been my own killer, pushed myself over the cliff, pain the fast approaching ground and still stood at the top laughing. I don't know on what it feeds, maybe the words it steals. I don't know if it's here or gone until the moment, the endless moment, living in the moment, fucking liminal. I'd like to know if it will end me, premature me, that's all. Are my reparations pointless? Am I losing or winning? What fills me? Pain, uncertainty, pain, uncertainty, uncertainty, pain, 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 uncertainty, pain, pain, uncertainty, uncertainty, pain, 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 uncertainty, uncertainty, pain, pain, uncertainty. find it hard reading that one uh yeah it's not the entire way I feel about my disability I actually feel pretty positive about it a lot of the time but it's how I feel about it when I think about it from a medical perspective certainly um and the medical perspective is a well we we're we're going to talk about that isn't it it's a twisty one um these three poems I've realized they all share words and phrases with each other um they run kind of into each other they were they were written very far apart that one was written about a year ago and this one I wrote when thinking about coming to this event so this is pretty new this is like maybe a week old new baby poem um and it's a bit of a fantasy really I guess um because I had yet more blood tests recently um yeah I wonder what happened to all the blood. They took it repeatedly, ad infinitum. The tubes were tiny capsuled vacuums. The spurting rush led me to marvel at how quickly and painlessly they can take these days. It was for tests as permitted by the doctor, usually not the ones that I requested, I lent our therapist drops to write a scarlet letter, a missive on listening yet to congeal that will never be read. The results said nothing, of course. I've expelled fluids on that before and rarely raised the pressure to lift my arms. But what happened to it after? The lab technician pumped it as fuel into his desperate failing car. The phlebotomist used it to spray paint her walls. The doctor monthly expelled it to delay menopause. The hospital ruby polished their dinted floors. The government claret tipexed my right to support. The blood tried to leach back to my parents or a riverbank or a red planet I'm not allowed to inhabit, or soaked into wooden desks, or clotted into bricks that built nothing, or reformed a soft me somewhere, loft life-size, boundaryless, liquid. The blood could become intangible tracking. In truth, it has probably been long since incinerated. Thank you so much for listening, folks. Um, 
Jean mentioned I have a book uh, with my grandmother, uh, which I didn't read from today, but uh, I will put the link to that in the chat. Um, and yeah, I just hugely appreciate being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I uh, can't wait to hear everyone else. Thank you very much indeed, Rihanna. Uh, our next poet has been supporting Together's pop-up poetry work for some years now. Dion Williams is a deaf queer poet working with British Sign Language and English. And I'm just, ah, here we go. Pressing all the buttons tonight as well. So DL has performed around the UK, including at the Scottish Storytelling Centre, the Wales Millennium Centre, the Barbican and the Albert Hall, as well as in America and Brazil. Their bilingual poetry collection, Interdimensional Traveller, was published by Burning Eye Books in April 2022. Their work has also been published in Modern Poetry in Translation and Mag Magna Magazines. And so I'm delighted to hand over to D.L. Williams. Thank you very much, Jude. Um, so my name is D.L. Williams, and I'm a white androgynous woman with dark brown hair, uh, currently buzz cut on the sides and some length left on the top. Sort of about a thingy swept to the side. And when I turn my head, you can see a hearing aid in my left ear and a cochlear implant in the right. Um, I'm wearing a dark blue shirt and I have dark rimmed glasses and I look nothing like Harry Potter. So I'm a bilingual deaf poet working with English and British Sign Language. And I like to explore the different ways in which poetry can be brought to life through both languages, whether it's by using SSC with spoken English or BSR with voiceover. So just to be clear, um, SSC is um, sign supported English, it's where the signs follow the English word order is when I'm talking and signing at the same time, for example, what I'm doing now. And so just to be clear, this is not BSR, which has a completely different structure and grammar. And I just wanted to be very clear about that because there's a lot of misconceptions out there. So that, but that's why um, what I'm doing now and what the BSR interpreters do looks very different. Uh, so the theme today is um, lived experience of the medical profession. I finished a poem that I started writing a while ago because uh, I thought it matched the theme perfectly and actually finished it yesterday. Its working title is Familiar. Um, yeah, Familiar. So I was just thinking about the sign for that. Um, but if anyone has any better ideas for a title, I'm open to suggestions. Just going to move back a little bit. Make sure you can all, yeah. So, the nerve, the taste, runs past the inner ear. I was informed of this fact on the morning of the surgery. Six months of eating, with half a tongue, while the other half lulled uselessly around. Another reason to wonder if I'd done the right thing. Flavours slowly returned, as did sound. Some familiar and welcome, others less so, others long lost, needing to be reloaded. If it's genetic, 
might go back. I was informed of this fact on the morning of the surgery. Instead of six weeks of recovery, six months of my body rebelling, by tin the pins in my foot. Another reason to wonder if I'd done the right thing. Normality slowly returned. And I apologise because my cat has just completely disrupted this. Of course he has. I've got to go back like two minutes and try again. Trust him. Ah, the joys of Zoom. Uh, anyway. Six months of my body rebelling, biting the pins in my foot. Another reason to wonder if I'd done the right thing. Normality slowly returned, as did my foot's original shape. My body again familiar, the idea of home lost to mutiny. It still might not work. I was informed of this fact on the morning of the surgery. Instead of six weeks of recovery, six months of my body rebelling, biting the new pins in my foot. Another reason to wonder if I'd done the right thing. Normality slowly returned, as did my foot's original shape. My body, again familiar, the ideal form lost to mutiny. The only option now is to break every bone in your foot and start again. You'll be recovering for at least six months and it still might not work. Thankfully, I was informed of these facts before we got anywhere near surgery. I chose not to go ahead. The occasional stabbing pain. Another reason to wonder if I've done the right thing. Then I remember what happened the last time and the time before that. And consider it a brilliant dodged. My orthotic souls a walking stick. This body is familiar. May not be ideal, but it's mine. Oh, uh, thank you and apologies again for the cat. Um, so this next poem is just a bit of a riff on mapping, which is map with a capital map or mapping. And that's when a new program is created for an implant and the program is based on the user's audiogram uh, by testing their C levels and their T levels, uh, their comfort levels and their threshold limits. And they have hearing tests using the CI. This poem was published in What Meets the Eye, The Deaf Perspective, and that's uh, an anthology of deaf poets published by Arachne Press. Mapping a new landscape. A new map is being drawn. With each new sound, another shade appears. New countries, entire new continents rise from the abyss. Long lost mass. Previously, on which probing signals, receiving no response, and tissues for the tears. Now we discovered this unfamiliar terrain is charted by screens and wires. New lands are sketched, valleys and peaks are graphed and defined. 
this church we have noise, comfort others with threshold limits, denoting the boundaries of acoustic tolerance. Here be monsters. Beware the cackling, crackling crisp package, seeking the last crisp. Profound the blurring, waffling, sinning, chattering TV adverts. Be brave when birds are tweeting, chirruping themselves, singing beyond guard, the ambushes from random, unexpected repose. A new map is being drawn. Long lost lands now we discovered this territory of noise. Here be monsters, be brave. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to finish with the poem that um, it's not known. Um, well, it just references some of my medical experiences and I wrote it for myself as a kind of like self-affirmation after a long time ago I read yet another article talking about costs and the NHS. Hmm. What is the worth of my life? How should this be defined? By the neighbour of my body or the neighbour of my mind? Should it be me, my burden, my cost to the welfare state? Should I tally up my expenses and see if the figures equate? The cost of midwives at my birth who freed my strangling cold my very first operation, my care on the neonatal world, or the cost of my second operation when I was seven to save my sight, breaking the stitches on my eyebrow must have affected the price, or the surgeries on my foot, wasted money, I'm sorry to say, stubborn body piling on the expenses, so shall claim motability someday. What price for the counselling, for the therapy and the pills? Depression and anxiety just adding to the bills. And let's not forget audiology. I can't imagine the bell so far. Suffice to say, this implant alone could buy me a nice new car the financial product of my neighbours fails the test of the balance sheet. Unless I become a rich poet, my costs I can't begin to meet. So how do I define my worth? I judge it by the worth of my days. I've travelled to several continents. I'm a carer with an MA. My poems have shown me the world and worlds besides my own. They've helped me see through the eyes of others and understand I'm not alone. So my message to RDS and to the daily higher, judge us not by what it costs to sustain us, but how we make our lives worthwhile. Thank you all for your time. Have a good evening. Thanks so much, DL. Next up tonight is an artist who I first met last autumn. Marcella Rick is a writer, director and actor who is passionate about regional poetry and storytelling. Their work is unapologetically scouse and queer, 
often exploring storytelling in non-traditional ways. So big virtual round of applause. Welcome, Marcella. Thank you. Thank you, Ju. That was, thank you. That was fab. Um, and, oh, I am um, a white ginger, but not naturally. It is henna. Um, non-binary poet and I have a button-up shirt that I just got from a charity shop that I'm very excited about it's blue and has lovely stripes um and yes thank you for that introduction I don't consider myself um a typical poet so a lot of my poetry is mostly a line up to a joke where there are underpinnings of of things that I think are really important and messages that I'm trying to get across um so if you hear something and you wonder are they serious probably not um this first poem is called my friend Hugh with an addition my friend Joe and um yeah I will I will get started now a couple of years ago our country was struck with the utterly unpredictable loss of a frail 96 year old woman who tragically died peacefully in one of her palaces. A line of optimistic monarchists adorned the streets with hope and litter, dedicating five days of their lives to a queue to see a box with a flag on it. Gifted bevs and pizzas as they slept on floors usually swept of the queen's homeless. Adorned with blankets, kept warm in the knowledge that they did not share the fate of the 8,329 people who slept rough in London the year before. The Queen dedicated her life to serving our country for the modest reward of two palaces, three castles, an estate, an undisclosed salary of a few hundred million quid, and unfettered access to our country's political decisions. Access that she reserved for noble causes like lobbying to hide the details of her private wealth and legally protecting nonces. The Queen outlived my friend Hugh. It's both what a bit of stolen wealth can do in it. She died in her palace with her family by her side my friend Hugh was found as unidentified remains around seven months after he took his final breath. I don't think there was much left. The queen died leaving behind a trail of atrocities, monstrous oddities that stain our history books. My friend Hugh would have loved to leave books behind, but his would have been filled with communist witches, autistic warlocks, magic and poetry and a hazy understanding of the fundamentals of vegetarianism. The Queen outlived my friend Eric, whose shy by day exterior hid the campus dancer to ever hit G-Bar. The Queen outlived my dad's friend Kim, whose glamorous fits were the talk of all Garston barbecue spreads. The Queen outlived my mum's friend Hugh, uh, Paula and her baby. Amelia. The Queen outlived countless countries whose land has been occupied, resources drained, homes ruled in blood with a white face placed as head of state. The Queen outlived everyone I've ever known to have died. She probably outlived your loved ones too. But still we were asked to mourn as if we should give a fuck. That's why when the church bells chimed and the country seemingly came to a stop, I sat and wrote of the lives I wish could have made it to 96. And I used to end my words there, but less than a year after this country crowned its next heir, he outlived a friend of mine. And I'm here once again asking why? Why the fuck are my friends taking their own lives faster than Charles could list the communities he deprives? And all I have the energy to do is make less friends? Because I can't bear to see another gorgeous queer life come to an end. Or another lad from down the road packed off to quote unquote defend the crown, the monarch, some fucking bell end. I 
don't know what I want you to take away from this soup of words. I'm just tired of suicide wrapped up neatly into a package of speak and you'll be heard. We're past the point of hearing because what healing can be done when young people grieve young people in a place where God save the queen is replaced with the king and the song just drones on. Me and my mates don't know when we'll lose another one. I guess God save the queers, God save the dykes and fags, fuck, God save the straights and all, because some of them aren't that bad. God save the rest, the people with rescue cats that piss all over the bed. God save the hopeless Swifties with shit songs stuck in their head. God save us all and everyone, as long as we don't kill foxes for fun, as long as we don't buy the fucking sun, as long as we didn't get a, jo a job from our dead mum, unless she's sound and not an inbred coloniser. God save Eric, God save Hugh, God save Kim, Paula and her baby too. And fuck you for making me say it, Joe, but God save you and all. I'll see you in the next life. Until then, I hope you're having a ball. Um, I should have probably warned you that I was probably the, the biggest language warning. I, I use language and it's not all um, great. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm also a lot of my poems are quite long so that was my one and I've got another one because I timed myself before and I could just go on and on so um, this next poem is called medicine I think I might have spent my life reaching for the medicine the thing that will fix it the, the perfect chemical combination to resolve the problem that is me when I was seven it was a bright yellow solution modestly branded as the one and only brain formula, beneath which it whispered its claims to soothe those overactive brains. I, I, pr I promise passed to my mum over the counter that her child would pay attention in school and stop getting in trouble for drawing on their books, the table, the floors, the walls, and yes, occasionally other people's. Every morning became a battle between me Mum and the pharmaceutical incarnate of the devil's piss. The oily liquid that assaulted each taste bud that lingered in my breath as I continued to write stories when I should be doing maths and run black market sweet shops when I should be writing stories. Fortunately for me, there's no better placed person to hide small bottles than a child riddled with undiagnosed ADHD. My mum never did find the medicine again, but that was okay because I promised to behave and I got better at hiding the times when I couldn't. When I was 14, it was the dregs of dusty bottles forgotten at the back of auntie's cabinets, the liquid that I could forgive for tasting like shit when it made the too loud tolerable, when it made stiff social interactions melt into mindless drunken chatter. When I was, I was 14 when I realised that I preferred the medicines that Boots pharmacists would never prescribe. When I was 21, it was green and ground, and just as paper became smoke, my nightly anxieties evaporated before my eyes. The molecules lingered in the air and settled themselves back on my chest as I slept, but that was okay, because for a few hours they were just vapour dancing with oxygen and the dreams my friends and I used to fill the air. When I was 27, it was prescribed to me by the adult ADHD services. I was told to weigh myself regularly because this doctor didn't know my family GP who urged us to purge our home of any semblance of scales and tapes. The doctor I'd promised I wouldn't obsess over my weight. So I had to decide which doctor to lie to. And I wondered how many of us have to do that to get the medicine we need. Now I'm 28, in the doctor's waiting room, just holding out to see what the next medicine will be, because this needs to be the one. Now I've lived in this chaotic brain for years, my head is completely gone. I'm looking at the NHS branded poster where the blonde lady tells me it's okay not to be okay. She smiles at me with teeth that I know she doesn't grind in her sleep. Help us help you, the poster implores, and I'd gladly comply if I understood what they were asking for. 
I'm supposed to speak up in times of crisis as if it wouldn't be more efficient for me to let them know when the crisis ever ends. Which crisis am I even supposed to be speaking up about? The climate crisis, the multiple humanitarian crises, the fact that I don't know the plural of crisis, the newsletter going out an hour later than we planned for that my manager assures me is a crisis. Choosing the crisis to focus on is its own crisis. And I think of the children of Palestine just struggling to survive. And I think of the people on the streets of my city fighting to stay warm in front of unoccupied luxury accommodation buildings that cast the shadows that they shiver underneath. And I think of the injustices that stretch so far that my brain can't reach their ends. And every day, Instead, it's filled with jumbled words and thoughts of what I should be doing while I'm pacing around with useless thoughts brewing of how it would be so much better if the people in charge gave a shit. So I guess whatever medicine they can give me, there's only one thing of which I'm sure. My brain may be sick for many reasons, but this world is sick to its core. Uh, thank you. That is the end of my uh, set and I'm going to put my social medias in the chat. Um, thank you so much and well done to everybody who's performed so far. It's been amazing. Thanks very much, Marcy. Next, I would like to welcome Vron McIntyre. Vron is a queer, disabled, wheelchair-using poet who performs regularly at online open mics and whose poems have appeared in a number of periodicals and anthologies. Their debut pamphlet, Random Trail, was published by Big White Shed in 2021. Vron also runs the poetry group, the Facebook group, Poetry Plus Events Online. Oh, and you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, the first poem is called, I Come From A Body. I come from a body that scavenges joy from everything it's supposed to be ashamed of, that takes people by surprise, that breathes strong magic. I come from a body that knows the inevitable transformation of one thing into another, the bending of straight lines, the queering into blossom. I come from a body held together with string, safety pins and sellotape that some would rather die than live in, unable to imagine my blessings. I come from a body that does the unexpected that knows its own indelible worth, that has its own agenda, that teaches me everything the hard way. I come from a body that has its own seasons, will no longer be hurried, makes its own way into its own future in its own good time. This next one is a poem about chosen family. Uh, contact morning for swearing. Uh, this is after Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samara Singer. This is the fuck ups. My people are the fuck ups, the ones who could have and should have but didn't, who failed to be motivated by carrot or stick, who have gaps in their work histories with no explanations. My people are the fuck ups, for whom things are complicated, things you don't think twice about, like eating and sleeping, like breathing and not crying. My people are the fuck-ups, the undiagnosed who fell through the net, who can't help questioning, who don't blend in with the crowd, who create living out of nothing. My people are the fuck-ups the ones who never amounted to anything in the eyes of the world, but gleam with their own rubbed shiny glow, rough pebbles tumbled to brightness. Ample 
evidence. Dieting is a marvelous way to get fatter. Science tells us this very emphatically. Study after study for 70 years all show that with grace and repeatable reliability, in the long term, say five years, at least 80% succeed, an amazing success rate. Only 5% have the heartbreak of getting thinner. So I did get fatter, as you'd expect, after each time I lost some weight, good old metabolism scribbling away energy with which to face the next famine, keeping me alive, looking out for my best interests, prioritising my survival. What I'm not entirely clear about is why, since I've already been so successful, these medics keep wanting me to do it again. However fat I get, it never seems to be enough for them. I suppose we must simply trust that our health professionals know what is good for them, good for us, that they are well versed in all the advantages a fatter body brings. More admirers, well, that goes without saying. Less osteoporosis, fewer operations, those are mostly done on thinner people these days. And clothes shopping is so much easier, with only one shop to visit, or none, a blessing to be spared the bewilderment of the multitude of choices with which the, the minor sized amongst us are plagued. No need to troll through the clothes racks in charity shops or queue at the merch store for t-shirts at gigs. And the way the world's going, austerity, plague, climate change, war, being good at survivings might come in handy. There are a few downsides, of course. Turns out, if you keep on dieting, it can take its toll, put a strain on our hearts, even shorten our lives. Didn't your doctor mention that? They say we have to suffer to be beautiful. No pain, no gain. So sometimes we just have to put up with the side effects. At least the research is unmistakably clear. Thank goodness for evidence-based medicine. This next piece is called Revolution. What you see, the expansive drifts of my body, a flood of flesh spreading softly over the surface of surrounding fields, a crowd run riot, rampaging through the streets unchecked, just let go to propagate their protest unpoliced. What you assume, incorrectly, that I have not followed your advice, because in fact this is where your advice led me in the long term. Loss followed by gain, followed by loss, followed by gain. But you are right in one respect. I am uncontrollable. I mean, you can try, but control can lead to unintended outcomes. Ha ha, the comedy conclusion of your serious pontification. My body gets the last laugh even as you punish it, withholding health care, pain relief, needed surgery for unrelated problems, lest that be mistaken for approval, for promotion. Disclaiming all responsibility for your role, it is all my fault. There is no hiding it. My existence is inconvenient, is provocative, is political, is a protest, is a big, fat revolution. It's a fairly new piece of mine called A New Place to Breathe. I'm looking for a new place to breathe. One where we can take in a lungful, feel it fill us up, let it out fully with all the emotion of its flow without feeling this ache that colonises our backs, our shoulders and their blades that hangs on us like a heavy weight we never deserved. Where we don't have to fight a health service that doesn't see us, that doesn't deal kindly with us, where we have to fight and fight and persist and persist in some superhuman way while being treated as less than human, faulty, 
defaulting, like it's all our own fault, as if fault lines didn't rift at rocks on the regular, as if anything is a monolith, as if there is only one way of looking at things and it isn't ours. I'm looking for a new place to stand, even briefly, where for a moment I'm not just deficient, demented, defective, defeated. Let's have a quick drink. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to read tonight. It's amazing to be here in the company of such wonderful poets. I'm going to finish with this slightly whimsical poem. The reverse luge referred to halfway through the poem is a reference to the long curved ramp which wheelchair users must climb to the first floor entrance of our local NHS treatment centre, a place that won awards for architectural excellence despite the lifts not coming down to the ground floor. It is called Escape. Your bed is the seabed. You are shifting to get comfortable, but always a sharp shell or sh oddly shaped rock under hip air mask providing underwater breath until you give up and start the uphill climb back to the surface, to free oxygen, to earth gravity, dripping as you start to wheel up that rutted track through the foothills into the high country you must visit to deserve help. That ramped mountain, reverse luge curving behind you, taking every weakened muscle to strain and push. You arrive out of puff, just in time to have your blood pressure measured. Be shuffled into waiting rooms through the hushed, officious limbo of grey tunnels into every consulting room you've ever seen. Equipped with protective gloves, prescription pads, all the paraphernalia that tells you who has the floor here. This time you must lie on your back, stare at the partition ceiling, remembering all those dramas where... People crawl improbably through ceiling ducts to save the day. You plan your escape in loving detail. Rescued by helicopter from the roof, hanging from a rope ladder, precariously swinging back and forth, hoping like hell you can hold on. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Ron. Our final poet today comes all the way from Sydney, Australia, where indeed it's already early Thursday morning. Cedar Whelan is an emerging writer of poetry, prose and short stories on themes of mental health lived experience, nomadic wandering, diversity and memoir. Whelan has been published in various anthologies, including by Hunter Writers Centre, Sappho Poetry, Borough Journal and Survivors Poetry. She has performed in Darwin, London, Sydney and Newcastle and has been exhibited by Lighthouse Arts Newcastle after completing their inaugural residency. She has won prizes from Hunter Writers Centre, Red Room Poetry, and is a finalist in the Joanne Burns Microdict Award 2024. So I'm delighted to welcome our first international guest from Australia, and no doubt not our last, and we'll be seeing Cedar again soon. So welcome, Cedar. Thank you so much, Jude. It's such an honour to be here and amongst such brilliant poets. Uh, the nerves have just kicked in. Uh, it's just on seven, ten to five to seven in the morning here, and I've been up for a while, so bear with me. I will be reading off the page. I'm a queer woman with long, curly, dark brown hair, pale skin, a red, purple, and yellow floral shirt a club-shaped piece of greenstone around my neck and purple glasses, which are not non-reflective. I'm sorry, all you can see is the computer screen in my eyes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm i in Mullabimba, which is Newcastle, Australia. Mullabimba is the Aboriginal name of the place. I acknowledge the Awabakal and Waramai peoples on whose unceded lands I live and write. 
and pay my respect to elders past and present. I acknowledge the rights and dignity of the queer and the mad. The poetry is the medicine. This first piece is called Transformation. The first time I saw your wounds, I was speechless, amazed by your bravery and determination, creating yourself, confirming your identity after so many years of dysphoria, medicated for depression, without even the language to express how you felt. T-shots and salves saved your life, but the battle to get them nearly broke you. You said you'd only waited so long so you could feed your beautiful babies. Tight t-shirts and pride now. No more baggy layers and having to pass in a binary world. So wondrous to see you happy and healing. Your scars are fading fast. This is a piece I wrote last week since getting the invitation to do this tonight. So here we go. Mags, my mate Maggie. Back in the 90s, we'd spend hours poring over your collection of female mythology and symbolism, listening to Katie Lang. Oh, the things you taught me. Constant companions, enjoying the best buds, always abundant. You, a film and music nurse, never a lack of customers. Mardi Gras 1991, you, a staunch 78er, in pride of place in the pride parade. You're in your Mackay tartan kilt, stole draped over one shoulder, one breast out and proud, golden sparkles and pineapple pasty, merkin for a hairpiece, strap on on your sporran. We partied all day preparing for the sleaze ball. Miss 3D doing hair, Dennis on makeup, ecstasy on board. My three-year-old riding your back in the photos. Oh, what a night. 1994, we were legalised at last and you were busted dearly. The day before your hearing, the three of us picnicked at the top of Dorigo Falls. We opened the roof of your Merc and screamed all the way down Waterfall Road. That night we made love, the first and only time. Sweet medicine. Four months in Malawa took your trust. All those so-called friends deserted you. Not me. On release, you left the country. No forwarding address. Oh, I'd love to find you now, you wonderful wild woman. Margaret McGregor Mackay. Release. It's my poem and I'll write if I want to. Write if I want to. You would write too if it happened to you. You tell me my writing is too dark, hurtful, dwells on a pained past. Didn't anything good happen? I should focus on the beauty of the present, happy times, connection with nature, all that. You've got the wrong poet. Panacea is writing for me, better than all the meds ever. My heart seeks the truth that needs expression. The more I scribe, the less I relive, react, am held back. Now remember, respond, move forward. Another tells me sharing my story makes it possible for them to share theirs. Together we diminish stigma, establish dialogue, call out the elephants. Our living experience being paid forward sets tongues talking. By acknowledging our past, we are released to the future. And here's another true story. <laughs> caught up. When they caught up with me, my car was full of books. They let me choose a few to bring to hospital. At least I think so. I don't know how else they got there. Caught up in trying to prove my reality, 
that my beliefs weren't fantastical. Auntie Lorraine's advice about the little people. Black Elk's prophecy about the tribes of the rainbow. Attenuated elixir of gold reviving mining remnants. All about ecosystems to be resurrected. There was a nurse, tall, male, attentive. I chose to trust, compelled to explain. He listened, questioned, understood, then told the head P-Doc. Solastalgia put me there. Mania made me stay. Immersion. We had a painting when I was a child, The Women of Putarara, a legend from Papua New Guinea by Glenis Kernke. Golden, curvaceous women, goddesses, worshipping a river, bathing sky-clad, reaching for the sun. Not for men's eyes, they'd turned to stone. Yet there it was in our dining room for all to see. A religious grandmother was horrified. That shouldn't be hung where children can see it. I loved it. It inspired me to cavort naked in any body of water I found in wild places, even in crocodile country. The best memory, the strongest I ever felt I had attained those women's freedom was a remote thermal spring, Kaderi, up a four-wheel drive track off the Nyu Road, out from Bachelor, down from Darwin, a sacred, secret, sacred place. Nude for days, tuned into nature, immersed in the place, full body mud masks washed away in the mineral rich water, floating downstream, spread out to the sky, healing for body and mind, the best I ever slept. I wanted to stay there forever and live that life. A little bit of insight into my reality coming right up. <laughs> Exit pursued. Running in bed, I wake in the dark, on my feet already. Nocturnal incubus pursues me, despite prazosin, suvorexant, melatonin, lamotrigine, nitrazepam. Heart pumping, brain in flight, find the lamp switch overbalance as I reach for it, stumble to the couch. Skin up a durry with shaking hands, on alert but quetiapine groggy. Is that even doable? Dissociating, zoning out, almost wobbling off my chair. Startle, trigger alarm, reliving nightmare. Relight my smoke, TV through closed eyes. Blinking open, then out again. How are we going for time? Um, Do you want one more? Yeah, let's have one more. That would be great, Cedar. Thanks. 2.30 a.m. kills. Awake again, pain arcing, stabbing hot, reach for the new, stronger painkiller. Not off sitting up, waver with it in my hand, jerk awake. Have I taken my pill? The box in my hand, no tick on the chart of myriad meds for my mind. I take one, then panic. Have I taken two? What will happen if I have? I sleep for an hour, jump start, wake again. Was I breathing? Echoes of the doctor's warning. What have I done? Consult Dr. Google. Contraindicated combinations. Consequences of high dose. Sleep anxious. Wake frequently until dawn. Find the pill on the floor. Reassured. In the fog of the wee hours, I had only taken one.
Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here, Fida. And thanks again to all of our wonderful poets this evening, Rihanna Valentine, D.L. Williams, Marcella Rick, Ron McIntyre and Cedar Whelan. Thanks as well to Arts Council England who funded tonight's event, to Debbie McNamara from Survivors Poetry who has assisted with the programming, to our British Sign Language interpreter, Chris Burrow, to our captioner, Norma McKay from Global Real-Time Captioning, and to the Together 2012 team, especially our apprentice, Ben Rogers. And a big thank you, of course, to our audience for your support. It would be much appreciated if you could also complete the very short feedback form. The link is in the chat. Check out our website for the rest of our events programme, which is all free and all online. We'll be announcing our June Pride Month event soon. Goodbye.